Um, this karakia was written by Scotty Morrison, um, and it's um, Tu Tawa Mai I Runga, Tu Tawa Mai I Raro, Tu Tawa Mai I Roto, Tu Tawa Mai I Waho, Kia Tau Ai Te Mauri Tu, Te Mauri Ora, Ki Te Katoa Haumie Huie Taikie. And the translation of that is come forth from above, below, within, and from the environment, vitality and well-being for all, strengthened in unity. Um, so welcome everybody to this morning's webinar. Uh, my name is Kate Matheson and I'm um, the honour today of speaking with Freddie Mutanguha from um, Rwanda. Freddie is um, the Executive Director of Aegis Trust. Um, he, with Aegis, he leads the um, Champion Humanity Education Initiative, which is um, an initiative that he will talk more about. He was developed in Rwanda and is doing um, amazing work both in Rwanda and in places where violence is starting to escalate, um, such as Central African Republic, Sudan, and Kenya. Um, Freddie is a survivor of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Um, he's an international board member of the Centre for Justice and Reconciliation in Cambodia, um, a member of the Miracle Corner Rwanda, and an external advisory committee member um, for the USC Shoah Foundation in Los Angeles, which I believe is um, a history archive around the Holocaust. Is that right, Freddie? Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, in 2016, um, Justice and Security Foundation declared Freddie a Peace Award winner for his um, outstanding contribution to peace. Um, so just some housekeeping before we start um, our talk with Freddie. Um, confirming that you're in the right place. This is a um, the webinar stories from Rwanda. Um, as part of the Te Tiriti Based Futures and Anti-Racism 2020 series. Um, you can interact in the Q&A and in the um, chat. It would be great if you could um, keep questions to the Q&A and chat to the chat just to help me pick out the questions to ask Freddie. Um, we do have a moderator for this session who will be moderating the chat in the Q&A. Um, yeah, that's probably enough from me. So um, the structure of today's um, corridor is that Freddie um, is going to tell us his story, which is um, an amazing gift. Um, I feel really honoured to be able to hear that, Freddie. Um, and then some time for Q&A and a bit of a fireside chat to use up the rest of the time. Um, so Freddie, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you very much, Kate, and I'm very, very uh, privileged to talk to you all, uh, wherever you are. And here in Rwanda is uh, is an evening, and, and uh, I know that New Zealand is in the morning, so good morning. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say uh, where I am, and, and Rwanda, it's uh, one of the smallest countries in Africa. Um, I'm going to compare with the New Zealand because um, I'm talking to Katie sitting in New Zealand. It's um, 10 times, uh, actually, the, the New Zealand, the, it's 10 times the size of Rwanda, which is really very big. But we have something that we, we uh, have to say that is uh, Rwanda has four times population than New Zealand. So it's, it's one one. <laughs> um, so this is, um, uh, it's my country. Um, I, I want to, uh, I'm going to talk about my history, my story. And um, I, I have to say it, first of all, that uh, genocide that happened in my country was not spontaneous um, uh, uh, in event. It was prepared uh, for decades. And, uh, and the final solution was in 1994. So that time I was uh, 18 years old um, and I lost my parents and my four sisters. I have, um, I have a picture I want to share with you. Um, if Kate can help and put the picture 
and and um, yeah, this is this is the one. Uh, they were killed uh, in the 14th of uh, April, 1994. And my four sisters, you can see this picture um, spent um, almost four years in the bush. So that's why you cannot see people very well. So, um, so bear with me about this one. Um, so, but in, in total, um, because in Africa we live in, um, in very social uh, style. So when you talk about your family, it's not your, only your mother and sister and uh, brothers, but it's all cousins and all people that you know that are related to your family. And in total, I lost 80 members of my family um, at the time of genocide. It's a big loss. Um, so um, in terms of history, um, all started with the colonization in the beginning of 19, 19th century, where the, um, the Rwanda been, uh, was colonized by Germanys first. And um, after the First World War, uh, the Belgian took over. And um, the two countries, the two um, colonial masters, they have one thing in common. One thing in common they have is divide and the rule politics, which have been um, the uh, root cause of what happened to us and to our families in 1994. Um, Rwanda was inhabited of uh, three categories of people. Who were, um, we have Tutsi, we have Hutu, we have Twa. The Tutsi was, were cattle elders. And the Hutu, they were farmers, and the Tua, they were uh, hunters in Rwanda forests in, in, in Rwanda and other neighboring countries. So these were not ethnic group or racial groups because we shared uh, the same culture, the same language, and some belief. We have one God. So there was were no uh, very distinct uh, difference between us. But when the colonial masters came, so the existing um, categories were made racial. And the division started from there. The seed of division that planted uh, by um, colonial masters um, resisted. And the mistake we made as the Rwandans, we accepted that we're different and we killed each other. So the Tutsi, at that time, when the colonial masters came, they tried to resist on the, on the colonial uh, politics, which become a um, bad thing for them because um, uh, they, were, uh, they started to uh, ask the Hutu to raise up and, and most of them were killed. Others uh, were made refugees in neighboring countries. But at some point of time, the borders were closed. And they could, and some people couldn't really leave the country. And these are people who've been persecuted for like 30 years, up to 1994. Uh, um, a million of Tutsis well, uh, well worked out. My father managed to escape in 1993, um, but he left uh, his fiance behind. Uh, who two years later. Um, my mother joined my father in Burundi. This is the south of the south uh, neighboring country in the south of Rwanda. So they both uh, managed to cross the uh, the borders and and they met again in Burundi. That was really good news. Of course, the bad news they were living in uh, refugee camps, but they also um, they were married uh, in refugee camps, and and then I was born. In, in 1976. Unfortunately, my father, uh, two years later, died in Iraq, and she, he left mother um, with all life condition in left refugee camp. She was pregnant of the second child, uh, my sister, 
uh, but 91 year later, because she left her parents and um, many of her uh, relatives in Rwanda, she decided to come back, even if the conditions of uh, Tutsi living in Rwanda was really um, not very conducive, but she decided to leave Burundi and come back to Rwanda. So when we came back, we went to um, our grandma, uh, grandma and grandpa um, house. We lived there uh, for uh, more than three years. And in 1981, my mother married again. My sister, uh, who was born after my, my, father, was, uh, my father died, uh, she stayed at my grandfather's house and then I went to live with my mother. Um, I didn't know that he was not my biological father. And I came to know that through a neighbor. And I think at that time, was, they become, um, it became much more harder for me because my mother never told me the whole story. And it was really a very hard time with me and hard to ask, who is my father? Where is, where is he? What happened to him? But this was really, I didn't know that this is really um, something my, my mother didn't want really to hear. And it was um, really uh, something that she was feeling that I would be told when I would be uh, uh, adult enough. In the region where we um, were living in, um, at school, we experienced a great discrimination as a Tutsi children. We were humiliated by teachers and other, um, and we were asked each and every morning to stand up. And sometimes, uh, because we even well, even minority in us were used uh, as a teaching materials, and they were saying that how many Tutsis we are in the country in in this class. We are five, and people learn how to count five. But this was uh, was not bad yet. What is very bad is that it's the comment made by teachers how these are Tutsis, and th that time the Tutsi were not uh, well dehumanized up to be called the cockroaches and snakes. And what the teacher, teachers um, um, comment were that these are, these are not, uh, these are cockroaches, these are, are snakes. And uh, this, the teachers made um, us to to be looked by the, our colleagues as enemies, because so this was, um, was uh, a word from a teacher and people and our colleagues really, um, they all believed that. But we didn't know what is going on because uh, I remember when I went back home, I was crying, I didn't know, and I was asking my mother, why you choose to become a Tutsi? And she didn't really, I didn't have a response from her. Yes, I was very young and very ignorant. Um, when um, the event I remember is that the Tutsi continued to be uh, persecuted. I remember in 1991, uh, when the, the genocide was tried in the north of a uh, country where 700 people were killed and they wiped out all families. Um, one of the, my mother's colleague, because my mother, she was uh, a primary school teacher and her colleague, uh, her name is Savera. She came, her, she came home crying. Uh, she was really confused. And she said that um, her family were completely wiped out. Um, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't really, believe someone in one night can come and kill the whole family, father, mother, brother, and sisters, and um, that time. So the other uh, incident was um, one year later when my uh, colleague, his name is Anselme, um, we, were, we were in at school together, 
and he got the message that his family and his entire family was uh, wiped out. And um, this included his mother further and all the, um, and he had the, um, two brothers and one sister. And uh, that time also was very hard to believe it. But he was crying, we were been supporting him as, a, as, a, as young, young kids. But um, my understanding on that was very low. I understood it uh, in 1994, which was my turn to, to lose my family. On 7th of April, I wake up in the morning and I heard that um, the plane that was carrying uh, the former president um, who actually was uh, uh, shot and the president died in the plane. I was very happy because I thought that uh, this is the person who been really persecuting our family, who had been preparing and, and um, all the execution and imprisonment and the torture so I thought that this is going to be to, is going to the end, but um, this was really different because um, my stepfather, when he heard about it, because I heard this before them, I went to their to their door and knocked to ask them if they heard this information. What his response was totally different, and uh, I was really a bit um, uh, confused. So he said that. Um, now we, they're gonna kill us all. He said it in, in my language. No, no, that said they're gonna kill us all, in, and no one will will actually uh, survive. This was true because um, two uh, two to three um, hours later, all roadblocks were everywhere in the street. No chance to escape at all. The militias and the, the military people, they were all, all over in the street and they were stopping autos to escape everywhere they go. They start killing people. We had a meeting at home to discuss what to do. My mother advised me to leave home because she was believing that probably they're looking for, um, they're looking for, um, for boys. And she said that uh, probably I can remain with the four sisters because my mother had um, four children with my stepfather. And those were all, uh, uh, they were all uh, girls. And um, she said that because you are only boy here, probably you'll be the one to be targeted. So I was um, given this advice by my mother to go and hide at um, my colleague and friend, uh, Peter, who was like um, um, 100 or 200 meters from my house. And uh, I went, he hid me in his uh, under bed. And, um, and my family used to give money to the militias when they come to attack. And this, this saved them for one week. Uh, the following week, um, that's how they, they came, was the final one. But in the between, uh, this family was very poor. They were very, uh, they couldn't have uh, three meals uh, a day, only one meal. I was not used to that. I was always hungry. My mother knew that. And she, she, used, to, um, she used to come and sneak during the night to bring me food and share with me the food and encourage me. That was very helpful. And for a whole week, I was very, very um, encouraged and uh, I had the hope that this will finish. And it was really a bit different uh, on the 13th of uh, April when she came with only fruit, beans and beans. Um, there's passion fruits. Uh, and beans, the passion fruits, because we used to have a big garden in the back of uh, of our house, where the we used to grow the passion fruits and the beans. She knew that I don't uh, like beans and vegetables, but uh, she came at that time. She was totally different. 
because she came very tired and hopeless, very quiet, and I couldn't really understand it. And she was, um, she couldn't say anything to me. And she looked at my eyes. She said, please, I know you don't like this food, but please um, have courage because this is what remains in our store. Um, because um, the militias for whole week, they've been coming and we've been feeding them. There's nothing to remain at the home. I was I started crying, but um, but I had I had a um, meal with my mother. I didn't know that was it would be last meal with her. And she looked at my eyes and she said that my son was our Mugabo, which means be a man. If we survive, if I don't survive to support you. Be a man. To be a man in my in my language is to encourage you. Uh, your son is nothing to do with um with the sex, but um or the gender. It's about encouraging someone that in difficult time they have to stand up. She knew probably because she feels she will be dying. I couldn't really um I was um, completely uh, confused. My, and this was true because the next day, the militias attacked my, my home and they killed my, fa- my mother, my stepfather, and four sisters. I could hear their voices until they finished them. I will never forget their voices. And these voices always come back to me when I think about them, especially my sister who were crying, talking and and pronouncing my name. I left, um, I stayed at Peter's house who accepted to hide me, he's a hero for me. I spent another week there. And then he, we had a lot of attacks, and um, I had, he had to help me to leave my uh, village where they know me. And um, I ran away to, um, because my um, my mother's sister married a Hutu guy. I went to see him if he can help me. I arrived there, it was really very hard because she, he had to protect my auntie. And when I went there, he gave me his identity card and say, please go and tell them that you are my son. This was a little bit helpful because I couldn't, I could, um, I crossed the road brooks. I went um, to the uh, south of the country and um, and the genocide ended after three months. I was still running. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have to, I will never um, go in, into details of what happened afterward. I would like to stop by here by saying that uh, the genocide has been a lesson for us. I survived this genocide because someone have decided to to be different to what his family was doing. Peter was a good person, was my friend, but his brother was the head of militias and he decided to be different from his brother. All the time, we have to remember that we are human and we are all connected. Peter, who didn't lose his um, humanity, I can see his brother was really doing things in a human way. But we need to, if we could have more Peters in my country, more survivors will be alive today. 
So thank you very much for listening to me. I would like to take your questions, if you have questions or your comments. And um, I have it, my, in the last time I gave, I mean, in 10 years ago, when I gave my testimony to Shaw Foundation was five, five hours testimony. I don't want to take all that time, but I would like to uh, get your questions if you have questions. And um, I would like to, at the, at the end, if you, uh, uh, Katie, allow me, I will talk more about my work and what I do. And um, probably you can have, have more questions later, but it depends on how Katie is organizing this interview. Thank you very much. Freddie, thank you um, so much for sharing such a personal and um, painful story. Um, yeah, I just really want to um, acknowledge the, the gift that you've given to us and that you give to the world through your work by sharing your testimony of what um, happened in Rwanda and, and your own story and also all your um, colleagues who do that same work. Um, yeah, so, so powerful. Um, and I know that you do it so that you hope that people learn and it doesn't happen in other places. Um, could could you tell us a little bit about storytelling and why you as a group have decided that that's how you want to um, to make the changes that you want to see? Yeah, um, <clears throat> as Kitty, you already say that I work for Aegis Trust, and which is running uh, the Kigali Genocide Memorial. And this is a memorial where uh, more than two. 150,000 victims of genocide and buried. It's a memorial that um, uh, teach about the history of Rwanda. But the question is, the history of genocide, what the place it has in, in the present and the future. We talk about genocide, but we want to know that we have to, have to say that people who survived, the perpetrators and the rescuers, they have a story to tell in order to give clarity to this, um, the, the history and what happened in Rwanda. So the storytelling methodology were used because for two things. One, um, in our education about our history, it's really cultural, culturally appropriate. Because um, the oral story, this is uh, actually what Rwanda is. We don't use um, for um, decades, there's no culture of um, reading and, and writing. So the haste, the, we use the oral stories to talk about the past. And secondly, it's about um, all the storytelling methodology that we we, it was because we faced um, a very big challenge in my country right after genocide. Uh, the survivors and perpetrators, they find themselves living together in the same village. They are not Tutsi land, they are not Hutu land. They are all living together. So even the children, they go to school together in one class, you may, you will find children of perpetrators and children of survivors. And how do you, as when we talk about genocide, how do we talk about it? How we talk, what message we give to children and make sure this message doesn't uh, bring collective blame to the Hutu and perpetrator children because they're innocent. What kind of message that we give um, to children that's not bringing more anger to um, survivors' children? But also we have to remember that those teachers, they either have, they either belong to one or one side or another, either they belong to the side of um, perpetrators or they belong to the side of of uh, 
of survivors. So the stereotype that goes on into classroom. But what we, the reason why we chose the storytelling methodology and the value of each and every one the voice is that um, when you tell a story, it's a real story and people listen to you. And this is not really a teacher standing um, in front of children talking about how people came with machete and killed people. But the storytelling methodology become much more inclusive. And what we realized in our teaching way, we find out the children, when they share their stories, they, they kind of, there's a buildup of empathy between them. People uh, get an opportunity to tell, to tell about their, uh, their grief, their, um, their pain, and we have seen that in this classroom, people really feel the pain of this. That's what's brought actually peaceful um, listening into the classroom, rather than it's narrated by, by teachers. It's very interactive um, in our teaching methodology. And, um, and this is came as a response uh, to, um, uh, to our education system in Rwanda. Because even the Minister of Education didn't know how to start and where to start this history of genocide. And when we started it, the story we choose, the story we share with children, and the way the children themselves, the the um, they see the role models into those stories. In we try to share the stories that develop a critical thinking, the empathy, and the personal responsibility. And then you can see in the classroom, they're building a trust between them instead of uh, creating uh, a, a division, a more division. And then I think this was really the right methodology at the right time in Rwanda as a post-genocide um, country. And this was um, uh, appreciated by the government because it came as a response to their challenge of how to teach about the, story, the history. And then it was embedded into the national curriculum. It was embedded in, in a way that was very innovative it was done in a way that it is into the old subject, even if, if you teach about biology, um, um, history, mathematics, and then we had to, there's an element of peace in that way, but also in all um, uh, levels, pre-primary, primary, a second level. So we find out in, our country, 80,000 teachers in my country, now they are, they, are, they are ambassadors of peace, which is very, very important. And in the way they teach it, they share their stories because we keep saying that everyone in this country have a story and each and every story can teach um, your uh, fellow teachers or can, can be a lesson for your children or stories of children can be a lesson to teachers, which is very, very important for us. Um, thanks, Rudy. Um, I just wanna say that um, there's been a huge number of messages coming in, sending love and thanking you for sharing your story. Um, and just to let everybody know that I'll make sure that we um, get a copy of this to Freddie afterwards so he can read all your beautiful messages rather than me um, telling you them now. Um, but yeah, thank you thank everyone you. for your for responding with such love. Um, you mentioned Freddie um, at the beginning of your story about um, the, the genocide um, kind of starting with colonization. And um, I know that um, in, in the recovery, you've also um, used government initiatives have been rooted in Rwandan culture rather than using the sort of colonial ways of sorting things out. 
Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and how important it's been. I'm, I'm thinking of um, initiatives like Gashasha Courts. Yeah. If you could tell people a little bit about that. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the question. Um, yeah, right after genocide, we, we, had, we learned a lesson uh, because um, unfortunately, genocide happened in this country. Nothing, nothing good about genocide, definitely, because it took lives of our, our relatives. But it happened. We cannot change the past. But it became a lesson for us. We learned that because when genocide happened here, the UN peacekeepers, they were in Rwanda, but didn't do anything. So many meetings in, um, in the UN uh, Security Council uh, they were gathered to talk about Rwanda, but the result was not to protect Rwanda. And uh, instead, what happened in this country was uh, happened in the watch of the world. And even the UN itself, they knew what was going on, but they didn't react or didn't protect people in my country. So after genocide, we thought that let's have our home solutions not looking for um, the solutions that come from outside, especially in justice system, because in this country, either if you are a Tutsi, the genocide left no, no um, professionals in my country. If you're a Tutsi, you are killed as a lawyer, or if you you're not the Tutsi and you're on the side of Hutus, you are in exile, for example. But this country, after genocide, we didn't have professionals, we didn't have lawyers. And what we had here, we had um, survivors crying for, for justice. And this country, we had so many priorities, including raising up economy, raising up uh, and respond to the cry of uh, survivors on justice system. We didn't have uh, teachers, we didn't have um, uh, doctors, because many of them have been involved in genocide. So particularly on, on the side of justice, we had uh, so many um, suspects of genocide. We had 125,000 of them in prisons in around the country. And if we go through the normal, um, inherited um, uh, uh, European uh, system of justice where you have lawyers and, 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 and we have a courts, they have to sit, they have to make all the long judgment. Uh, that was really, will take more than 200 years to finish the last case. We had to come back on our tradition to see how we used to resolve our, our conflict. And we had, what we call kachacha. Kachacha is um, one of the, the kachacha is um, a sort of, of a type of a grass that when, we, when, when it grow, it, it form a kind of a carpet under the tree. So it used to be the wise people when any, some, a community did wrong to another community, the wise people come together and sit down under the tree and resolve that conflict. That's what we, we gain again. Of course, we are, we are living in um, today's time. It was a hybrid um, a system which used the tradition, but also the, um, the modern way of um, a judgment. So it's uh, a time where the whole village become a witness because this, the genocide happen on daytime and everybody have been observing. There's a time where we say that um, if you are here in Rwanda at my age, you have a, you have a, you have a test, you have a story that I say that because we have seen things, you have seen people killing, you have seen um, your uh, people being killed. So the whole village come and the suspect of genocide, they come, they also brought to the village. And then we, 
is a system where the wise people were uh, selected into the community to be the judges, and then they had to um, they have to make a judgment to um, uh, to the suspect of genocide. What is very good on that is that the the judges, the wise people in the community, integrate integrate people in the community. They were trained but also was not just punishment. It was also asking the perpetrators to have, the, to have the courage to confess. And when they confess, their sentence are reduced. But also when they confess with survivors close to them, it's also an element of reconciliation. It's an element of telling the truth because when the people confess, they tell the truth. It was very hard for survivors, definitely, because um, it's not really um, a sweet story to hear how um, your mother was killed or your uh, sister being raped. And this is really very traumatic story. But it was also good on the other hand, because so many people didn't know where their uh, relatives' bodies were thrown um, or were buried. So they had to. Um, the perpetrators have to tell the truth of what happened, and and where they buried the bodies, and bring uh, and then the survivors can go, exhume those bodies and bury them in dignity. It had an element of truth telling, which is very important, um, and very important for survivors because uh, one of the pillars or element of uh, transitional justice is truth which is combined with a government guarantee to say that this will never happen again to you. Very important for survivors. So this is a system uh, which was supposed to not finish when we follow the uh, classic uh, uh, justice system, uh, tried in 10 years time, 2 million cases uh, in my country. And then why it become 2 million cases? Why we had 100, um, 125 suspects? Why? Because when they were telling the truth, they, say, they even told people they corroborated with, and we didn't know that. So when they were telling the truth and say, by the way, in the community with you guys, this person, I work with, I work with him. So he has to come back and be in, in, be in my place as well. So we find so many suspects we didn't know. One, because they, those people who were supposed to denounce, denounce them, they died because they were survivors. And then we have a place where there are no survivors, but the entire community can tell what happened. So that's how the number came from 100, um, at 125 to 1,000 to, um, to, to, to 2 million. So this truth telling was very important, but also gachacha was um, a product of our tradition, and uh, um, and then was not was not only punishment, as I said before, but was also restorative of um, uh, Rwandan's values and Rwandan's relations relationship in the village. Thanks, Rudy. I've um, written how to spell um, gachacha in the um, chat for anybody that wants to look it up and learn a bit more. Um, there's lots of um, questions coming in around um, how to recover from um, the trauma, both how, did, how have, have you, what things have you done to, um, to turn such a painful um, childhood into the amazing work and man you are today and also as a community um what are the things that you've found um have been helpful in terms of um recovering from trauma yeah um that's a good question um i have to say trauma is still a big challenge for us it's still a big challenge for survivors and and i find out recently that the the even perpetrators and children of perpetrators, they are also traumatized. And um, so it, it's very hard to, um, to, to say that we've been through the trauma in this country. 
because um, the survivors, they have seen a lot and they went through all the pain and it has been now uh, 26 years. And, and it, it's really, instead of the trauma reducing, we are seeing the trauma keeping um, increasing into uh, survivors community. Of course, there is a few things that happened and that what we're doing, of course, on my case, my, I was very privileged. Of course, I lost my parents. This was really traumatic. I didn't have anyone to take care of me after um, 1994 genocide. I was likely to be a street child because um, I think um, that was really um, possible. And, 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 but uh, thank God it didn't happen. Um, I kept listening to my uh, words from my mother that I have to be a man and, and I have to go through the challenges. I had the courage to go to school, but getting at a school, what helped me and helped my colleagues, we came together. We knew each other and we each and every evening after school, we have to come together and to tell the story of what happened during a day. And we, uh, we made um, a group of 10 um, children, two uh, students, and then we, we elected who would be a man, who would be a father, because we have families, we have eight families. And that person, and this is very true, which is very helpful. I was a father, and now by becoming, um, oh, can you hear me? Hello, yes, can you hear me? I can hear you. Your screen froze a little bit, but we can still hear what you're saying. Okay, okay. All right. So I became a father, and I had to take care of um, 10 children. And I had my wife, but it's not really a wife, but um, that, that person became a mother. So being responsible of others made me to, to overcome my own pain and my own um, uh, suffering. And it became very responsible for that because I have to check in every time the life of my fellow, stu my fellow students and my fellow survivors. And this helped them because if they have any difficulty, they will come to me and tell me, and then we find a solution together. Instead of not having no one to tell, which was really very bad for other uh, students who didn't have that initiative. We created an association, we still, still now going on, and they have like the 5,000 uh, students. I was among the, um, the founder of the, this association. And then it was implanted in different places, uh, in the schools. And uh, this was very, very helpful. And this uh, family, which is very important, and this family still exists. And I'm still a father of that family. It's artificial family, if you can say, but we're still very close. They are my sisters. And if I get, or my son gets sick, if I'm outside the country, who come to, support my, my wife for the first, they're the, one, they're the ones that um, the family I formed um, uh, like 20 years ago. So this is actually what happened, what the power of story sharing and the power of building a trust as a group, that's what's helped. And in, in, in Rwanda, we have 15 associations that really support uh, survivors, but it was formed by survivors themselves which is very important. And uh, by being together, um, this is my wife actually bringing some uh, coffee because uh, she thinks that I've been talking too much. And, and thank you, Natasha. <laughs> so, um, so I was um, saying that um, having survivors coming together was a therapy for them because we ran into the group therapy together by sharing our story. The government put in place some um, uh, more professional counseling uh, system, which also at some point helps. But I have to say that 
the um, the trauma is still a big challenge in um, in the survivors community, but also what is very um, discouraging is that we can see even the transmission of trauma from from uh, parents to to the children. And then this is really something we were not ready for that. We thought that um, we have seen a lot, but we need to save our children. But we are seeing our children are getting more traumatized than we are. So it's a challenge and a still challenge, but we uh, that's how I think that we need to get uh, the world, uh, people from around the world and bring in the experience and the, the, the experts um, even to keep uh, supporting each other as a human being. Thank you, Freddy. Very um, honest and rich answer there. Um, what in your work you do um, a lot of talks internationally and um, and working in in different countries in Africa and internationally. What other um, lessons that you the key lessons that you try to teach um, to people who haven't lived through what you've lived through in terms of recognizing early warning signs or um, any lessons? Yeah, what we teach is, um, you know, a peace education program uh, is that the, um, the racism divisions, it, it exists and it happens around the, uh, around the world. And we know that um, we need to teach our young generation and young generation need to be resistant and resilient to all racism that has happened around the, country, the world. They have to build the skills, how to question the, um, the, the ideas of the racist ideas. They have to question those. They have to be responsible of what, about the response for the actions. Even they need to get to the point, they can be totally different from those uh, racist ideas. We teach, and what we take to people in different countries, we, we take our stories. We say that we understand the cost of a division and the racism and discrimination. The cost of that, you lose your family. But there is um, good news is that when it's more easy to be united and do things together than be, being divided. We have seen in this country, we ever, never in my country for 50, 100 years, we never seen the economy booming together because we choose to be together and the economy raised up. We never seen this before. So when you come together, when you work together, it's really the right choice. That's what we teach to uh, different communities to make the right choice and be together than be divided. Thank you, Freddie. Um, Jacqueline, you had a are you living in a safe environment now and do you have your own family? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. Yes. Um, I feel safe. Definitely yes, safe. But I'm not, I'm conscious that Rwandans, you can make a mistake again if you don't care and take a lesson from the past. And this is very, very important important for, for me uh, because that's what I'm dedicated to do is to tell the story of the past because if we don't learn from it if we the young generation are not taking responsibility of the past and then it will be a big miss and then this is 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 there's a risk to repeat it so to be fully fully um uh, safe it will be the time where the young people have, will take in, will be in charge now, be responsible, and choose to make um, this 
country more peaceful. Of course, it is happening because we made the choice as Rwandans by talking about reconciliation, come together. This is really the right choice that we take, which gives us actually hope that this is happening. And then when we even teach other communities, we when you know so, so many times you talk about reconciliation, people don't know oh, what do you mean about that? I remember a group of uh, South Sudanese who've been in the world for like a 50 years. What they know is um, how I've become a hero and kill a hundred or 200 people in another community. When we brought the chiefs, um, the paramount chiefs from South Sudan, they came here. These are people been encouraging the young people to go and, and, um, and, and attack the, the, the other communities. They came here, they see survivors and perpetrators come and shake hands and say, I did bad to this person, but he, forgot, he, he or she forgave me, given me. And we live together in the same village, we work together, we grow crops together. And that's how we feel that we live in the same life. So the South Sudan is paramount chief were really, really um, uh, uh, interested to listen more about this one, but they, do, they went back with the message. So what I think, being in a safe environment, of course, we live in this world we have, <laughs> which is, which is never, which never, never been perfect. Of course, we need to be cautious. But I'm not wake up in the morning and think someone will bring machete in and, and cut my neck. That's, that's very important for me. But we have the work still hard and we talk to, to, um, to react to the hundred. Uh, oh, Freddie, we've just got the photo of your family up. Um, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. So I have to say, you seen like uh, a part of my wife passing here in the screen. This is um, the good news and which really make me um, happy is that I formed the family. I lost my family, but uh, I'm trying to get a family again and be a man, as my mother said. Is my, I have my daughter of uh, 10 years old. Her name is Nalda. Second, um, eight years old, her name is Kayla. And my big boy here down, um, he is four years old. And uh, we all say hello today. And uh, they allowed me to uh, give a space at home and can talk to you. And, and <laughs> that's really um, very good. So, so thank you very much for listening to me. For those who are um, interested, Freddie and his family are also on lockdown with the COVID-19 um, thing. And Freddie told me um, earlier that his children are loving, <laughs> are loving it, having the parents to themselves yeah. all day, every day. Um, there's so, so many more um, questions and comments, Freddie, and, um, and, and things that we could talk about, but I know that we're um, running out of time. I just, I've just i shared some links in the chat um, for the Kigali Genocide Memorial and Aegis Trust, which are the two um, organizations that work really um, closely together and that you work um, for. So if people wanna support your, um, your work or to learn more, there's um, uh, the Kigali Genocide Memorial has an amazing, um, is an amazing resource of people's stories and um, lots of things. Um, so those links are there. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's that's the um, all the time that we've got. But just thank you so much for um, sort of taking some time out to talk to us. Um, yeah, can't um, can't say enough how um, how powerful it is to hear. Um, hear a story like that um, from a person who's lived it um, and just you're so uh, brave and amazing for doing the work that you do and for sharing that time and time again I'm sure it doesn't get easier um, is there anything you'd like to say to 
before we close um, the webinar? Yeah, um, I don't have many things to say, but I want to to wish to everyone who's listening or on the online today uh, to wish all of us uh, health and safety for our family, families, and, and and especially this time we are in uh, lockdown in many countries in, in the world. We know that um, COVID nineteen is um, is really um, a little a huge and pandemic and very dangerous uh, disease, but um, I have a hope that we're gonna through it. We'll be through it, and then we'll um, rejoin and rejoice our uh, and go back to work and 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 be no more uh, again. So um, <clears throat> it it it's having an impact of what we're doing as well in terms of how we do it, and 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 I think. Everybody is standing online at this moment. So uh, we'll be uh, sharing more uh, insight and stories and um, about uh, reconciliation, about education on, uh, for peace, but also the learning from the past. We're gonna use more on, um, on, on online uh, platforms and uh, I'll invite people to, to go and visit and be part of this uh, journey uh, of peace. And uh, I hope we already created a community, so we keep chatting. But um, if you don't mind, you can share my uh, my email address as well. If the, anyone has a question or want to share with some, it, we share their stories because we need to share it. I uh, will be very curious to hear uh, others, uh, the people's stories. So um, please do it, and uh, we stay safe. And I thank you very much for your patience uh, to listen to me. Uh, thanks, Freddie. Yep, yeah, I'll put your email in the chat um, so that people have um, your contact there. Um, so to close us off, I just have a um, fakatoki, which was shared the other day by Stacey Morrison, and I think it um, uh, it rings true in terms of our. Our, this time that we're all going through together in the world and also um, what you've shared with us today, Freddie. Um, so that's ka ora pia o ia koe, ka ora koe ia o. And the translation is perhaps I survived because of you and you survived because of me. Yeah. Thanks everybody for joining us um, and thanks again, Freddie. Thank you.